So this is a home and community-based composting workshop. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Jess, and I've been the person who's been emailing you with the details about this workshop. And I'm also going to be facilitating the Q&A portions of this workshop today. So just a quick overview of how that's going to work. In the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you should see three options. It's um, Q&A, raise hand, and chat. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, problems with audio or something of that nature, if you could direct those questions to the chat feature, we'll assist you there. We're not really going to be using the raise hand feature, so you can disregard that one. But we will have Q&A breaks paced throughout Najiha's presentation. And while Najiha is presenting, you're welcome to submit questions related to the section that she's covering using that Q&A button. Um, we won't be able to answer all of your questions, but I'm going to do my best to pick out the questions that are coming up most frequently. And then I will verbally address those questions live to Najiha um, then. And just to let you know too, we have Spanish and English language speakers here today. So if you can submit your question either in English or in Spanish, I will be asking them all in English, but um, uh, I will be translating any questions coming in in Spanish into English to ask. Uh, and then Jesus will translate them back for those Spanish speakers that are joining us. So let me just scoot forward um, to our agenda for the day. Um, I'll just go back here for a moment. This is what I was referencing. I didn't advance, but um, this Q&A is what you'll use to enter any questions you have related to the content and the chat is for any IT issues. And then this is our agenda for the day. We're almost done with my intro, and then we'll briefly cover programs from the San Mateo County Office of Sustainability. They're the entity that's funding this workshop today. And then we'll jump into the wonderful world of composting. So Najiha will start with an overview of the Compost Hub program, and then she will provide sort of a lecture overview of the backyard hot pile composting how-tos, and then she'll head outside into her garden for some live compost demonstration. Then we'll kind of wrap up with an ending poll and some ending thoughts. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Ivana to cover some information about Office of Sustainability programs. Thanks, Jess. And good morning, everybody. It's nice to see 102 people on this workshop. It's amazing. Um, there are some interesting uh, aspects of COVID and transitioning to online workshops that we're getting a lot of people. So I'm pleased to see so many people uh, spending their uh, Saturday mornings coming here to learn uh, how to compost. So good morning and, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ivana Andrade. I work for San Mateo County and the Office of Sustainability. And the goal of our office is to build a sustainable community, <clears throat> excuse me, build a sustainable community that fulfills the needs of the present and the future. And so uh, the department that I work in, the Office of Sustainability has a number of different program areas in different topic areas. So they range from uh, affordable housing, uh, area called Home for All, where we uh, organize and advocate for housing options of all kinds in San Mateo County, active transportation where we are uh, planning for and facilitating and raising money for active transportation projects to facilitate more active modes of transportation in San Mateo County. And then we have a, a group, group around climate ready, sorry, around climate change and adapting to climate change and also reducing our emissions uh, that contribute to climate change. We also have resources for green businesses or businesses that are interested in, in improving their environmental practices with special focuses on small, uh, small businesses and small business owners. We have a, a number of different resources around uh, energy and water conservation for renters, land, land, uh, landowners, homeowners, single family, uh, just a range of different uh, resources there. So if you think there's nothing for you uh, in, in the realm of energy and water conservation uh, at the county, think again, there's a, there's a lot of different things available for folks, even if you are renting. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Peninsula Clean Energy, which is our clean energy provider. Uh, last, yeah, thanks. Um, 
and there's options to opt up to cleaner rates of electricity if you're interested in that. Um, and then the last one and the most salient for our workshop today is the waste reduction uh, area of focus in our office. We offer a number of different uh, robust resources for folks, a sustainability hotline, schools programs, community garden programs, grants, uh, and a, a number of other things that I'm not mentioning. All of, all of this is listed on our website, but uh, under the guise of waste reduction and climate change, we're, we're, this is where this, this workshop is coming to you from. So uh, the program is Sustainability Academy, and the goal of the Sustainability Academy is to provide a free education uh, to anybody who's interested to raise awareness about complex social and environmental issues, empower residents to take agency in their own lives in ways that they can, and build community leadership through experiential education. This has obviously taken on different forms now with COVID, uh, but that's the purpose of this program. So what does the Sustainability Academy uh, do? We have a number of different classes and workshops. We have a Master in Local Sustainability course uh, that's coming up in the, in the, actually it starts at the end of this month and registration is open and we still have some spots open. So registration closes on Monday. So if you're interested, uh, you should uh, register and I can drop the, the link to, the, to that in the chat here in a moment. We have a Master Composter course uh, that will be offered this summer. We have the home composting workshop series ongoing. We have edible home gardening workshop series that Jesus uh, leads. And we have a number of other offerings uh, that I won't go into detail here, but um, if you're interested, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter so that you know all the, all the cool things that we have coming online this year. So there are a number of different people that bring you the Sustainability Academy. We have myself in the top left, Camille, who's our volunteer coordinator. We have Alejandra Warren, Jeannie Pham, Todd Sutton, Jesus Jimenez, and Joe Lees, and Jess Ko. And uh, Najiha should be on this slide as well, um, but that's more or less the team. We have a number of different instructors that uh, if, you are, if you stick with us, you'll hear from pretty much all of them. So, for coming to this workshop, and I hope that you stick around, uh, we offer, the county offers uh, different kinds of discounts for different kinds of bins. So um, on the left is a soil saver bin and we basically offer 100% discount. You basically get it for free. It's $138 value for the bin. Um, and for attending this workshop, uh, you, you get this bin. So we really help you get started by giving you this awesome bin. Um, and then on the right, you have a tumbler, uh, less ideal sort of system, but we do still offer for a number of different reasons, but it works for some folks. So we do offer a, a discount on that. Next slide. Oh, I should mention, if you already have a bin, um, previous slide, go back for one second. We're limiting one per household. So if you've already received a bin through the offer before, you're unfortunately not eligible anymore. Sorry. So discounts continued. Uh, we also offer $15 discounts toward an additional accessory. So like a compost aerator, compost pail. For more information about that, um, you can check out our website. We also offer a healthy $200 rebate for building your own bin. So these are pretty cool. And Najiha is going to show you a version of this. Um, if you do this, uh, we can reimburse you 200 bucks. OK, uh, Jess, how are we doing? Should we pause for programs or should we blaze on? Should we pause? Um, there haven't been any questions that have come in, I don't believe. So I think maybe we should blaze into um, Introducing Najihan Hassus. Let me just check. There's something that came in in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I think we can move forward. Okay, great. So uh, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat and I'll attend to them as we go. 
So our translator and uh, lead instructor on other workshops, Jesus Jimenez. Jesus is an educator, aquarist, and facilities engineer at the Marine Science Institute since 2006. Here he teaches uh, composting classes um, and leads the edible home gardening uh, group. He runs an urban aquaponic uh, nonprofit organization to help bring fresh produce to underserved communities and food uh, deserts. So um, really uh, amazing wealth of uh, knowledge uh, in Jesus. Uh, so I hope that you tune into a future workshop um, where he shares his uh, knowledge on gardening and, and growing plants. Um, I'll introduce our lead instructor, Najiha, Najiha Al Al-Azmar. And um, she is an education program specialist and she dedicates her time to East Palo Alto based projects, including the collective Roots Garden and Taking Root Urban Agriculture Youth Leadership Pilot. As well as, South, as well as the South Bay Veggie RX nutrition education classes. She works, it, she works to make uh, these things more affordable and accessible to find resources to learn how to grow and share locally grown organic produce through building gardens and maintaining garden resources. She grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area as did Jesus and graduated from the University of California Irvine in 2012 with a BA in psychology and social behavior and followed by a master's, in science, master's of science degree, excuse me, in integrated eco-social design from Gaia University International. She's interned for various organizations that focus on social justice and nature preservation, such as Irvine Ranch Conservancy, Actera, Hidden Villa, and the Pachamama Alliance. Her work as health promoter for the nonprofit Nuestra Casa in East Palo Alto sparked a passion for building community in underserved communities. She loves the outdoors, growing organic produce and cooking, all of which I can attest she's very good at. So uh, we're lucky to have Najiha and Jesus here today. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to your instructor, Najiha. Thanks, Najiha. Thank you, Afana and Jess and everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about black gold or compost, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of context, a little bit more context about what Collective Roots is, um, what we used to be. Uh, so now we're officially Fresh Approach and the Collective Roots Garden is essentially under this umbrella of our programs now. Um, and the Collective Roots Garden is really a space uh, and an edible uh, space and resource for folks in San Mateo County and specifically East Palo Alto, uh, to be able to grow uh, their own organic produce uh, in, in their backyards, hopefully, or really local uh, nearby at our community gardens. So it's a network, essentially. We call it our collective gardening network. Uh, and in this network, we share all types of resources to be able to grow our own fruits and vegetables. And this includes seed swaps, seed exchanges, uh, soil, compost, uh, any greenhouse space, greenhouse supplies, uh, anything really to get you going. We also do garden installations. So if you do have space, um, you know, even on your balcony, we do different types of planter box installations, setting you up with that soil, setting you up with those transplants or those seedlings, as well as those seeds. So all sorts of ways to get you ready um, for planting, especially now uh, in the spring season. We also have other programs um, in addition to having healthy food access. So one way is growing your own food, but also knowing what to do with it. So as Ivana said, um, I like to teach about nutrition as well. And we have a program called Veggie RX, where we teach uh, uh, the community members how to use their produce and how to maximize your produce uh, of nutritional value. So we talk all about the importance of shopping at farmer's market, why it's important, um, and how to use it. <laughs> and then, which leads me to our last program, our farmer's markets. So we have different types of farmer's markets. Uh, we have our traditional one here in East Palo Alto and in Richmond. Uh, and then we also have our farmer's markets that are mobile, essentially taco trucks, 
uh, just full of farmer's market produce. And we go around at different routes in the South Bay as well as the East Bay. So if you want more information on that, I will uh, leave my, my email and then I can get back to y'all when it's appropriate. Right on. Next slide, please. So a little bit more in depth of what our Collective Roots Community Compost Hub is. We started this compost hub back in 2019. Uh, we received a 4 R grant from the Office of Sustainability in San Mateo County. And we did this in order to reduce food waste, to relocalize community-based compost, and to improve soil quality for better land stewardship and preservation here. And essentially, we're still building that community aspect that we want. So this program is awesome because it really bridged the gap between our farmer's market and our community garden by inviting community members to donate their food scraps in exchange for more buying power. We give vouchers for folks uh, who give us their food scraps uh, at our farmer's market uh, and growing power uh, from the compost that's made from this amazing resource. So it's a good option for those of you who want to contribute to creating compost, but don't have the space or capacity to make it at home. Uh, fortunately, you know, we're here to learn to do it at home, but uh, it's kind of a good alternative for those of you who don't have the space. And if you want more information on that, I could definitely follow up after the workshop. So why, why are we doing this? We talked about reducing uh, food waste. And essentially hundreds of thousands of tons of food is wasted every day in the U.S. And when broken down, this is roughly about one pound of food wasted per person each day. Can you imagine? Uh, so this food rots in landfills. It releases methane gas, which is a really potent greenhouse gas. Um, and on top of the climate impacts of growing landfills, there's also the environmental impacts of all the energy and all the resources that went into producing that food in the, food in the first place. And to put this even more in perspective, 53% of all food wasted actually comes from individual households, it's not the producer, it's not the farmer, it's not the manufacturer. They all have a part in it, but more than half of it is wasted just by neglect or just not thinking of, of ways to use this, um, this food to the max. So essentially reducing household food waste is so important, so vital to reducing climate impacts, gas emissions, um, but also a little more money in your pocket as well. Next slide. And what's interesting about our system is that we created a closed loop system in which participants purchase fresh local farmer's market produce. So they take their goodies home, they use it in their meals, and then they collect those ends, right? They collect those food scraps, those apple cores, the banana peels, they put it into these buckets, and then they bring those food, back, food scraps back to us and we integrate it into our community composting systems. One of those is our collective root community garden, which we're gonna take a look at in just a moment. And then we turn that into rich, nutritious compost to be used in other garden spaces as well. So what's really cool is that not only can you get vouchers for your um, food scraps, but we also prepare buckets full of that rich compost and then you can exchange it also for, for compost in your garden. So it's this really nice closed loop system. Next slide. So a little bit more in depth of how it works, how the community compost uh, works, how you can get involved. So essentially we recruit participants from East Palo Alto and San Mateo County uh, via online promotion, through our nutrition workshops and other events like this one. We use flyers, word of mouth, EPA uh, farmer's market promotion as well. We do tabling events, or we used to a lot more before COVID. Um, so there's just different ways that we reach out to folks to let them know about this program. 
And essentially, when we do talk to folks about it, uh, we have folks take a workshop. It used to be an in-person one-hour workshop. Uh, we would all come together and learn about composting. And now we've converted it into a 10-minute YouTube video. So essentially, I, we send the link out to the person who's interested. They watch the 10-minute YouTube video. Uh, it talks about what the program is, what composting is. And then at the very end of the video, we ask you to sign a contract. Uh, and essentially, it's a survey. If there's a link underneath the video. You click on that, take the Google Form survey, and then you electronically sign it after you take it. And then now you're, you're registered. You're part of the hub. Um, and essentially, we put you on our roster. And we reach out. We let you know when and where you can come pick up your new bucket uh, to start collecting your food scraps. And then once you collect your food scraps, you come back the following week um, and we check for quality. We weigh it just so that we can track how much food we are diverting from the landfills. Um, and then we really check for quality to ensure that we're integrating materials um, that are good for our system. And we're gonna talk about what that means in just a minute. And as I said before, we offer incentives. So uh, we weigh the materials, and then um, we check for quality. And if it's good, we give you $4 in vouchers to spend at our farmer's markets. We have a pamphlet as well. It's not just our ETA farmer's market. We also have partnered with uh, different PCFMA, which stands for Pacific Coast Farmer's Market Association, um, uh, partner farmer's markets, as well as other farmer's markets that we've just gained networking with. Um, so we give you a booklet if it's your first time. And then you can use your vouchers in that way. And then the other thing I talked about is that you could also get, instead of just a clean empty bucket, you could also get a bucket full of rich, rich, rich compost. And then what we do is we integrate and we maintain um, these food, these, food um, these compost piles. And so once we, uh, we intake these food scraps. We take it over to our community compost um, sites. Uh, we have two three bin systems here, and I'm gonna show you all what those look like in just a second. We also have a food saver bin. So there's just different systems that we use here. And then we maintain those piles and we sift it out and then we prepare them to be distributed or to just be used within this community garden space. And so these hot pile systems are what we're gonna be talking about and showing today. So if you're interested, I could definitely share that link with you to become a Compost Hub member, but I imagine y'all hopefully will just take the reins and create your own compost systems at home. Um, but if not, you could definitely reach out to me. So right now we're currently working with other partners in the EPA community. Uh, to expand uh, this compost hub, pro hub program and include more community compost hub sites. So we're hoping to kind of create this ripple effect of all of these different sites that we can create um, this rich, amazing topsoil for communities. We also offer technical assistance as well um, to help you uh, start your own compost hub if you'd like. So we do have a workshop that we did last year on how to create your own compost hub, meaning if you know of a community site that would benefit from a compost hub, um, we could definitely support you in that. We have a manual as well, and we could definitely um, help you get started on creating that. So essentially you, if you have the capacity to create a community compost hub, uh, we would definitely um, give you the resources to, to start something like that. With that, do we have any specific questions? Just to take a temperature yeah. check. Yeah, um, there is a question from Julia asking how many people are part of this community composting hub? Yeah, absolutely. Currently we have about 65 members in our hub and that's about two, three bin systems worth of maintenance. And that's why we were like, wow, we really need to expand these systems if we are gonna get more and more members. Um, so that's just to kind of keep that in mind. And, and we talk about that in the manual. Um, 
yeah, once we reached about 50 to 60 members, we realized that was kind of our capacity with these two, three bin systems. Um, and then Mary asked about, sorry, Mary asked uh, what farmers markets currently have this set up. She goes to the CS CSM farmers market and was hoping to find a link around which other farmers markets are involved. CSM, that's San Mateo. Um, College of San Mateo. College of San Mateo. Actually, I think we are working with the Phoenix Garden to set up something over there. So it might take a while, <laughs> but right now we're currently just in East Palo Alto doing this. Um, but we are working with other community gardens just within San Mateo County to be able to expand these as well. And we're going to work with um, specifically at the Phoenix Garden in San Mateo with neighboring farmers markets there. So you're in luck because within the next year or so, we'll have it set up for you. Great. And then Jessica asked specifically if there's any activity in Daly City around this compost hub. Not currently, but hopefully soon if this works, this expansion works, then definitely we'll, we'll try to reach as far and wide as we can. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, a couple other questions, if it's okay. From Christina, Absolutely. I checked the website of the community garden. It says it's closed. Are the programs working now or should we wait for COVID to be gone before engaging? Our programs as in like all of our programs at, at Fresh Approach? I'm not sure. Given that this person referenced the community garden, perhaps they're talking mm -hmm. about access to the garden. Just yeah, yeah. So right now we are developing um, protocols or we have developed protocols for volunteers to come back to the garden. Currently, we don't <laughs> let anyone just, you know, come in publicly. Uh, but uh, we, we are, yeah, we've developed some new protocols and starting March 26th, I believe that's that fourth Friday of the month, we are going to invite volunteers to to come back and help us out with these programs. So um, if you're interested in that, I could definitely give you the link to our website for y'all to, to sign up that way. Or you could just go to freshapproach.org um, forward slash volunteer, and you could probably sign up that way as well. And uh, yeah, so I will say that we will have a max of about four volunteers on site um, so it probably will fill up pretty quick. <laughs> Great, yeah. Um, a couple other questions. One person, Karen, asked, are we able to buy seedlings from the community garden? Yeah, absolutely. We just started some um, a couple weeks ago in our greenhouse. Maybe if there's time at the end, I could give you all a tour of the whole site. Um, and then you could see what's growing in these greenhouses. Um, and if you have any specific requests, uh, we could do our best to accommodate and start those up for you. We also have a greenhouse workshop that I did a couple weeks ago, and I could send that link recording to you, and then you could you know, learn all about how to get your seedlings started as well. Awesome. And then you could absolutely purchase these seedlings. Or we usually um, raise donations for them. So anything y'all want to offer for these seedlings is much appreciated. We are a nonprofit. Great. Um, the last question that I'll just touch on before we move forward is from Finney about the question is what are some of the seed trade exchanges? So I'm guessing maybe that would be like what kinds of things are you exchanging perhaps and Maybe that question is getting at whether there's a plan for any more in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So when COVID started, right, like I just started mailing out a lot of seed packets to folks. Uh, we do a lot of seed saving here, so we'll like prepare some packets. So usually what I've been doing, if you're not able to just come and pick up seeds um, or set up an appointment with me to pick up the seeds, uh, I just mail them to you. So if you give me your mailing address and sort of what you're looking for, I could definitely send you out some seeds. Um, what we used to do is have these gardeners gatherings, which I miss so much because we would gather, have a potluck, watch a documentary, and just chat about different garden topics. And then in those garden gatherings, we would exchange different seedlings and seed swaps. It was just a really nice communal space. And I hope to bring those back one day at some, you know, to some degree. But um, currently, because of COVID, I think we're just waiting. Um, 
eventually it would be super cool and y'all could just bring all your different, you know, things that you want to exchange, ideas, you know, we're very open here and it's a very safe space for folks. Great. Um, there's a couple more questions, but I think maybe we should move on to the next section and then we can maybe address these if we have time a bit later on. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see a couple questions here, actually. I don't know if you want to answer them. Um, why are oranges and lemons not allowed in the compost? Mm -hmm. I will, I'll I thought we would then just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right, okay. um, we can go on to the next slide. All right, so today we're talking specifically about hot pile composting. Um, and essentially, we're like I said, we're taking our food scraps from home, our yard remains. So this is like grass clippings. Hopefully there's not pesticides on those. Um, you know, our, our different yard clippings and um, prunings and uh, leaves and things like that. So any organic matter. So organic matter is really anything that just decomposes naturally into the earth. Um, and then we're converting it into this nutritious compost. Uh, and I like to call it black gold because you'll see it's, it's such a long, it's a pretty lengthy process to get this amazing product in the end. And so we add this organic matter to our garden uh, and it's super important, not only for adding nutrients into our soil, but also improving the soil structure as well. Um, sometimes you'll get a fertilizer from the store and it might add nutrients, but it won't improve the integrity of the structure of the soil. And that's what's so cool about compost is that it kind of encompasses a lot of things, not just nutrients. And so for our, uh, our systems, we chose a three bin system just because we knew we had a larger capacity, uh, but you can also uh, do a single pile um, if you have a smaller space. Uh, and you could also, make a pile out of many other types of materials like wood pallets, uh, you can purchase lumber, you can use plastic like the soil saver or the bio stack, a tumbler, or you could be super thrifty other than like the wood pallets and just dig a hole or a trench in the ground. It works just as well. And ideally you want to create a pile that is three cubic feet, which is three feet high, three feet long, and three feet wide. So this is essentially the most manageable size for a hot pile uh, to reach the ideal temperature that we want in these piles, which is between 100 to 150 degrees. And it's essentially the easiest to control these components. If it was a little larger, you could sure reach that temperature but it's kind of harder to like manage. It's, it's a pretty laborious um, activity. So you kind of want to create a pile that's going to be yeah, manageable for you. Uh, unless you're like super bulked up and you're like, eh, I could do anything. And then you could, <laughs> you could probably go for a larger pile. Um, we actually started that way here um, because we had some residual stuff um, and it was really difficult to manage a huge pile. Um, and we'll get into why that is in just a second. And then just to give an idea, uh, if you're creating a three bin system, either at a community space or your own space, you're gonna need about 10 feet long, four feet wide and four feet high to be able to have that space to, to really manage these, this area. And then if you wanna expand, you could always add more systems um, in the long run, right? But I recommend to start small. That's the way I started, actually, like really started starting small. Um, and then you can kind of build those systems as you go. Uh, and then another idea, and I know that San Mateo County has um, workshops on uh, vermicomposting as well. So it's just exclusively worm composting. And, but we can get into that in, in another workshop. So yeah, so here in this picture are just some good examples um, of different styles of bins. And then the first one, we talked about that three bin system. 
that plastic bin, the wooden bin, the tumbler, the trench. I will say that the tumbler is a little bit more uh, challenging. It's pro probably a good option for those of you that live in an apartment and have a balcony. Um, but you will have to inoculate it with some sort of uh, live material in there. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But essentially, when you build your system, those critters down below the soil are going to crawl up and be like, wow, this is a buffet. This is a hotel for me to live in. And this is where I want to live to create, you know, they don't know they're creating compost, but this is essentially what they're doing. If you have a tumbler, it's off the ground, right? Um, and there's a chamber in there. And so it's kind of encased in this floating system. And it would be really hard for those critters to get inside that system. So you kind of have to, you know, go to your friend's compost system maybe and then grab like a good handful of that live um, material and bacteria and worms and things and then stick it in your system. And then it will naturally, as long as you're feeding it the right stuff, it will naturally create the, the compost that you want. What's nice about the tumbler is that it's good for the labor part of it. It helps you kind of just it's on an axle uh, axis, so it tumbles like very, very easily for you. But yeah, the only thing is that it's kind of just hard to um, to get that that live material into the system. All right. So speaking of our friends in the compost, next slide. Who makes our compost? So I talked about this before, essentially, these are our decomposers. These are our champions in the compost that are breaking these materials down for us so that we can have this amazing amendment. I like to call them the FBI, which stands for fungi, bacteria, and invertebrae. So these are our friends like our worms, spiders. I know spiders are creepy, but they're awesome because they're super vital in the garden Spiders are our friends, uh, beetles, millipedes, centipedes, different type of fungi, uh, roly polies, super cute. Um, and then you'll see like different types of bacteria in there too. So you'll see a little bit of mold and things like that. So essentially they break down these materials by eating our food scraps and then living in those yard remains. Um, so these little critters are like us. They need food, water, air, and shelter. And so, like I said before, we essentially create a compost hotel or a compost lasagna. I like to call it the lasagna because it's sort of like a recipe. Reaching those optimal temperatures and the right um, ingredients to create this is really important. And then it creates this amazing black gold. Next slide. So how do we create this lasagna or this hotel for these guys? Um, essentially, the materials we'll need are carbon. So this is our dry material. This is the stuff that they live in. This is the stuff that they like to just cozy up at night when they're ready to go to bed. Um, and it's also the stuff that helps with absorption in the pile to mitigate um, moisture levels and add the carbon component, which is super crucial to create this amazing uh, amendment and fertilizer. We also need nitrogen, uh, which is all of our green scraps and materials. So these are our leafy greens, our food scraps, like our apple cores, those banana peels, eggshells if you want, but they gotta be rinsed out. Um, you don't want the, the residual egg in there. Um, I will say, that we don't want any <clears throat> any organic material like bones or oil um, and we'll talk about that in just a second but um, we do encourage mainly it's like a vegetarian or vegan type of hot pile if you think about it because we only want really just coffee grounds tea bags and then those vegetable scraps as much as possible in terms of ratio content um, it's very arbitrary, I think, just because a lot of carbon material, material or the brown material has different absorbency levels. So you kind of have to play around with the recipe to get the right ratio down or the consistency you want. Um, 
people uh, generally a good rule of thumb is about three uh, three carbon to one nitrogen ratio. Uh, so a lot of nice brown material along with your your green material. <clears throat> Um, but again, uh, if you're using straw, it's a little different from cardboard, which is a little bit different from wood chips of the absorbency. So you really have to just mitigate depending on what you're, what you're using. And then essentially to create these layers, and we're going to do a demo at the very end here, um, you want to mince up these materials um, as small as you can. Don't spend all day on it. But as small as you can to create this nice even layer of these um, up this pile. And we want to do this because it kind of gives the critters in there a head start to start breaking this stuff down. If you throw like a full on uh, gourd in there, some sort of like spaghetti squash or something like that, it's going to be hard for them to be able to like masticate and break this stuff down. Bacteria will start doing this job. But if you kind of give it a quick mint with your with your shovel, um, it kind of gives it a, a kickstart to be able to start decomposing faster. And I talked about this. Mitigating moisture levels is really important, and you really want the consistency like a wrung out sponge. So when you squeeze it, the material, it should kind of feel, yeah, like damp, but not like dripping wet, and you don't want it dry enough where it's just crumbling, because water essentially is the life for all these um, critters and all this, um, this life to be able to, to live in this system. And then the last ingredient we want is air. So air is super important to mitigate these moisture levels as well. Um, and it helps kind of let the pile breathe. You want the, the pile to be able to breathe. You want the, the hottest point, which is the center, to be able to, to cycle out into the outskirts of the, of the pile itself. So a lot of times the outer uh, edges of the pile will kind of get dry, and then the inner will be very nice and wet. So you kind of want to um, pretty frequently, maybe once a week or every other week, uh, just turn the pile, get the air in there. You can also use an aerator, and we'll talk about what that tool looks like in a second, just to get um, just like an even consistency, right? Just sort of like a recipe, right? You don't want your pasta to be super dry on the outside and then super moist on the inside. You want that even, even bake, right? And it's a very aerobic process. So all those critters in there need air, and they also need water and that food to, to, to survive. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> and I talked a little bit about what we don't want in these piles. Um, I, I want to say that the city compost, so San Mateo has a, has a compost system. Their systems are at a much larger scale. They have these amazing machines that are able to aerate the piles and turn them really well. And then their temperatures are much higher than a, than a garden compost. So they can reach up to like 250 degrees in their system. And so they can take things that are not necessarily um, plant-based materials. So they can, uh, the city can take in, um, you know, large quantities of breads and meats and bones. Um, but in our systems, we really can't use that. So we really just don't want to put things like that in there. Another reason why we don't want to put like dairy, meat, oils is because we don't want to introduce uh, any, any sort of unwanted friends in there or unwanted guests uh, like rats and raccoons, that sort of thing. That sort of, these materials invite those sort of unwanted friends. Obviously stuff that can't decompose like plastic or metal and then I put citrus in here because worms are just not, um, they, don't, they don't really like citrus. It's, uh, citrus is a very strong material. It's very antibacterial. So if you think about it, like there's so many recipes on how to create like citrus cleaning products, right? Um, and so citrus just like kills a lot of good bacteria, not just the bad stuff. And that's why we don't want to put citrus. And the same idea goes with onions. Um, in this picture, it's hard to see, but onions uh, kind of have the same idea. Onions are amazing. They're very medicinal um, and they're antibacterial. 
So they're great when you want to, you know, want to combat colds and build your immune, immune system. Um, but they also kill all the good bacteria that's forming in these in these hot piles. So we just, you know, a little bit is okay, but we just don't want like a lot of those materials in there. We also don't want to include disease plants. So if you have something that gets a disease in your garden, don't spread that disease by throwing it into your compost system. It will compromise it. And then no biodegradable like bags and utensils. Those are perfectly good in the municipal city compost because of those high temperatures, but in your garden compost, it's not hot enough to break down those biodegradable or compost utensils. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're, when you're creating your piles. All right, that's a lot of information. Any more questions? The next slide. <laughs> we do have quite a few questions. Um, so I'll just start from the top here about sort of what can and can't go in there. So the first person asking about this is Wendy asking, can you add chicken manure to a pile? Mm. Uh, chicken manure has to be composted before you can add it to your pile. Because if you add it directly, it's super duper, um, it's just a very concentrated manure and it could burn your compost as well. So you don't want to add just chicken manure directly. You want to kind of let it sit, uh, maybe in a little bit of pile of mulch or something, maybe some wood chips or straw, maybe for a few weeks, and then you can introduce it into your pile. Because if it goes directly in, it's again, it's the same idea with the onion and citrus. It's just going to kill a lot of good bacteria. It also emits like a really uh, intense like methane gas. So uh, you want to kind of mitigate that a little bit before you add it. Same thing goes with horse or cow manure. Same idea. You want to kind of let it sit and then you can add it. And it's an amazing amendment. Absolutely add it, but you just have to know when to add it. Great. Um, the next question is from Dana. Did I understand correctly? No eggshells? We, eggshells are great. Um, we just don't want any of the residual egg yolk or um, uh, whites of it. So make sure you're, you're cleaning them out. What I like to do, uh, um, if I eat egg, I don't eat a lot of egg, but I'll clean it out like in the sink with like hot water and kind of just give it a little like blast with that water or I'll let it sit in a bowl of water for like an hour or two and then it kind of just like plops off um, and then I can put it into my compost bin before it goes outside. So yeah, so eggshells are great. Um, yeah, just make sure there's no gunk in there before you, you add it. Cool. Um, and then Georgian asked, can cardboard and bags have ink on them? Oh, that's I'm a very like good printed. point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, minimal ink as much as possible. You want it just as brown as you can get it. So as, as, you know, un, un, unprocessed <laughs> cardboard as much as possible. Take the, uh, the plastic off as well, right? There's a lot of plastic tape. This includes like Amazon boxes, even though they say their tape is biodegradable. I see little shards of fiberglass within that tape. So I would take it off. Um, a little a little pro tip, um, soak your cardboard in water. And it's super easy to take the tape off that way. Because if you do it when it's dry, it's a lot harder. <laughs> mm -hmm. I um, use a wheelbarrow to do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, someone also asked, can you have citrus and onion in the tumbler system? Is that kind of more permissible mm. of those things? I, no, I, I would say no. Um, it's the same idea. You know, if you introduce those critters into your tumbler and then you introduce an antibacterial thing, it's just going to kind of um, slow your process down. <laughs> Great. And then Pat asked about onion skin. Is that okay? Just not the actual... Onion. A little bit is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> okay. And then like the end, onion ends. But I recommend if you have that onion end with the with the root attached to it still, regrow that. You could take that root and you can pop it in your garden and then you'll get fresh green onions um, just growing from an onion scrap. 
Great. Um, and then a couple of people asked about garlic in the pile. Does that fall in the same category as that onion? Yes, it's the same category. A little bit is fine, but it's not a lot. Okay. They're in the same family. Same with shallots. <laughs> <laughs> And then Tavia asked, can avocado and pineapple skins be used? I add pineapple, it's totally fine. Avocado, I also add even the, in, even the seeds. We'll get a lot of like avocado volunteer plants, which is fine. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's an organic thing. It kind of just helps with the structure. The skins take a while to decompose, but it, it, it helps with the structure of the compost pile for sure. Got it. Um, let's see. Mary Kay asked, why no bread in the pile? Yeah, so essentially we just don't want to invite um, unwanted friends like rats or raccoons. Uh, they love that stuff. So they'll go straight for that stuff. And then you'll have all these unwanted guests in there. And we just mm -hmm. don't want that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Makes sense. And I, um, we will, yeah, I will say that you want you know, you want to cover your pile and that's why it's important to put a lid on it. Um, and then any, you know, chamber to kind of enclose it as well. So if you have an open pile, it will work, but you, you, you know, you run the risk of uh, unwanted friends getting in there. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Stacy then asked, what about pulled weeds in the compost? Mm, very good point. Um, weeds without seeds, Yes, weeds with seeds, no. <laughs> and the way you could tell is sort of just looking at the observation um, of the plant cycle. So if you see a weed, try to get the weeds before like late January, early February, um, because that's right around the time when weeds start to produce seeds. Um, so you wanna try to get them in like December, you know, when they're babies and that way you can kind of control them um, to benefit your garden. You could also use weeds to uh, use as sort of this green manure, uh, which is sort of just like weeding it and just leaving it on top of your, your garden space. And it will kind of serve as like a, yeah, like a green manure, like a, like a, like a natural just um, bed cover and it will decompose in the same sense as, as sort of a compost system. Great. Um, do we have time for a couple more? Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so Rosanna asked, what about uncooked potato skins? Are those okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. I recommend organic as much as possible, but it's totally fine. Okay. And, and hopefully the very, not diseased. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> Avoid yeah. disease in there. Mm -hmm. um, Mary asked or said, I've heard that the browns, the leaves, should be dry when you add them to the pile in order to sort of uh, qualify for that role. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you put in green leaves, it just acts as like a nitrogen or a green material. If you wait until those oak leaves turn into this nice crispy dry, it will act as your carbon. Yeah, so it kind of, when stuff, you know, transforms, it goes from nitrogen and when it, when it like it dries out, it turns into a carbon-based material. Great. Okay. Um, let's see, there's a few other questions that I think you will get to in this next section. So I'm not gonna ask those, but I will ask one more from Tabia. Uh, Tavia asked about retail compost starter and whether you have any experience with that or if that works. I haven't heard of that. So I don't have any experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not you. sure what it is either. <laughs> but um, <laughs> perhaps, we'll perhaps Tavia, if you, yeah, we can look into it. Or if you have more detail about what exactly that is. Um, mm -hmm. We can maybe circle back to that later if you want to add more detail. Mm -hmm. I think the rest I'll be able to answer in um, writing or we could get to later. So I think we could move on to the next section. Sounds good. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, 
yeah, let's talk about what tools we're going to use when we are creating and maintaining these piles. So, so yeah, you really want to make sure that your, your structure, your space and receptacle are ready to go and you have your materials ready as well. And you also want to have these tools handy to help you set up and maintain these piles. So these tools that you'll need are a compost fork. So this makes it easy to move bulky and larger material around, like maybe a straw barrel, straw barrel material or stuff that's more fibrous. A compost thermometer. So next. So this is nice because it has a very long probe to it, and then you could check the center of the pile and see how hot it is, and I'll show that in just a minute. A wheelbarrow. So this is awesome because it helps you move you know, raw material around. You could soak things like the cardboard I was talking about. And then it also helps as a receptacle for when you're sifting your finished compost uh, for it to be easily transported. Speaking of sifting, a sifter. Um, and sifters, you could buy one online. I think they're like 40 plus dollars, but you could also just upcycle wood, like a two by four if you have scrap wood, you can go on different, you know, online databases like Craigslist and get two by fours that way or any sort of untreated wood. Um, and, you know, cut it up into a nice square and tether it at the corners. And then you just want to add some hardware cloth where you can get at any, um, you know, uh, home improvement store. And then you can staple it on or you can use finishing nails to do that. And essentially, this will help you separate the, the stuff that hasn't really decomposed from the black gold and the compost that we're, that we're looking for. A shovel. A shovel is amazing. Uh, it's good for chopping up the materials to smaller pieces. It's also easier for those smaller particles once the compost is finished to be able to transfer things back and forth. And then last but not least is an aerator. Um, it's a good... Uh, it's a good um, tool to draw air into the pile and maintain the aerobic process uh, and to move that bottom compost to the top for that even homogenous mixture that we're, what, that we're looking for. You could also turn it using a shovel. So if you have a little bit more space, you can literally take a pile and just kind of move it to one, you know, one side to the other. Maybe it's you know, maybe your pile is three feet cubed, and then you will have it about six feet of room, and then you can just move it next to it. Um, and then just move it that way with the compost fork, but an aerator just makes it easy for you to kind of just wiggle your way in there, and then you can kind of bring it up to the top that way. I found another method, if you want to be super frugal, is to just take your compost fork and like stick it in and kind of shimmy it in down too, and kind of create air pockets that way. Um, so there's just different ways that you can bring air into the system as well. All right, so these are our tools. Let's get into the method. So we talked about the different layering components, what materials we need, right? Um, and once you have your tools, you're ready to start your pile. So like I said before, you want to break up your materials, the smaller the better. Same thing goes for the browns. Uh, wood chips are already done for you, right? But if you have cardboard, you kind of want to, you know, rip them up to smaller, smaller pieces. And like I said before, I use a shovel to mince my greens, um, like my food scraps, um, just because maybe I'll throw like, yeah, something larger in there and I just kind of want to give it a quick mint. It's sort of like preparing your meal, right? You don't want to throw your whole onion into the soup. You want to kind of cut it up into your different you know, sizes before you add it to your, to your recipe. We talked about wheelbarrows and how they're useful for soaking up, um, you know, putting your cardboard in there, adding water to it and let it um, absorb and then it's super easy to rip apart once it's wet and it's sort of like pre-soaked right so you probably won't have to add as much water to it um, and it's easy to take off that tape if it has any on it and then we talked about dry leaves a little bit um, 
which is super easy, right? You could just rake those in your yard and then add them to your pile. And make sure that they're dry because they'll act as that carbon source. And yeah, and then creating these uh, layers, really. Three inch layers uh, within this three cubic space. So you got three inches of the green stuff, three inches of the brown stuff, and then you create these alternating layers. Um, and yeah, and like I said before, I like to think of this as a recipe. So the greens are my veggies and my sauce. And then the, the pasta is the brown material, that dry material. So we're creating this lasagna and it's building up. Yeah, and we talked about, you know, inviting air into the pile because it is an aerobic process. Um, and then maintaining those proper moisture levels like a wrung out sponge. So yeah, speaking of maintaining moisture levels and just troubleshooting, can you go on to the next slide? Yeah, so there's different things that could maybe uh, be challenging in a compost system. Um, let's say it's a little smelly and stinky. Maybe there's extra fruit flies than normal. Usually that means it's too wet and too soggy. So you just want to add more carbon material to your pile. And you can, again, just the same process, just kind of layer it up. Make sure at the very top of your pile, you're putting a carbon-based layer, like a dry layer, and that will help mitigate, um, you know, inviting any excess uh, fruit flies and the like in there too. So making sure at the very top, you kind of cap it off with that nice dry material and that will help, um, yeah, just avoid different like stinkiness or smelliness as well. And then the other side of that coin, if it's too dry, um, yeah, you just want to add more water. Um, I, use, I try to use gray water as much as possible with those buckets. Um, we'll wash them out and then we'll add the gray water in that way. Or you could just use your hose and spray it um, into the center or on top and it'll trickle down. Again, we just want to maintain that moisture level like a wrung out sponge. You could also add more green material um, to the pile, um, but I'm kind of uh, on, uh, on the caution of adding too much green material once the process starts going. So once the decomposition really starts, I give it about two weeks. After those two weeks, I stop adding, um, you know, too much new material to my pile, just because I know that by the third or fourth week, it's already sort of uh, in its stage of, of processing the material. And last but not least, um, uninvited friends. Um, so these are things like our raccoons or rats or squirrels. Um, ants could be a problem sometimes. We want a little bit of ants, they're okay, but if there are a lot of ants in there, that usually means that the pile is too cold and you want to heat it up. They don't like a very hot environment, so heating up that process will mitigate ants. Ants are great. Uh, the only problem with ants is that they farm aphids, and as if, if anyone's a semi-experienced gardener, Aphids just love to eat all of our fruits and vegetables and they will essentially kill our plants. So to, you know, cut out that middle, middle person, we just don't want ants in there because they're very intelligent and they essentially eat the aphid larva. And that's why that sort of is a red flag when I see ants. I'm like, oh, this means I'm gonna get aphids. So I probably wanna heat this up a little bit more. And then we talked about raccoons and rats. Um, you know, we just don't want to add materials that they like to eat. Uh, we want to use a, a lid of some sort. Um, oh, and another thing, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's in a sunny location or uh, a, a, a shaded location. Um, the only thing is sort of like our plants. If it's in a sunny location, you're going to have to add more water to keep those moisture levels. And if it's in a shady location, it's easier that those that water won't evaporate as fast. So that's sort of the, the, the pros and cons to where you put your compost system. I like to also put my compost system in a shady location because that means I have more sunlight for my plants. And, um, you know, I'm just being more strategic in the garden that way. And then, you know, the shady areas, it's like, I can't really grow anything here anyway. I might as well use it for a compost system. Cool. I think we're good on that. Next slide. So, yeah, 
a lot of, you know, all, after all this time, it takes about, if you're doing this pretty, um, pretty consistency, uh, consistently, um, you should get uh, compost ready to sift in about three months. So it's, as you can see, it's a pretty long process. And like anything, it's going to take time to learn this recipe, right? Like anything, you don't just automatically know how to make lasagna. <laughs> so it's going to take some iterations to kind of perfect this, this recipe. Uh, maybe like a full year really is what it takes to, to really perfect that and really understand how the compost works. But after that, it's just this amazing resource for you to have. So when is it done? So I said it takes about two or three months, sometimes longer. And this is a hot pile system, right? So if it's a hot pile, it's pretty, this is considered quick. If it's a cold pile, meaning you create this pile and you kind of just leave it, you don't touch it, you kind of don't do the aerobic process. Um, and it, it'll still decompose, but it'll just take a lot longer for it to happen. So that's why it's so important to kind of keep it move in and keep those optimal temperatures and those moisture levels consistent. So yeah, so really like the signs that you want to look out for, for when it's ready, essentially you're checking the temperature, right? And after it starts kind of cooling down, um, you'll see that it goes from about 130 degrees and then slowly it'll start cooling off. So once the, uh, you know, it gets to less than 100 degrees, it's sort of a sign for you to like know that it's almost ready. You also, when you, you, you know, you put your hand in there and you look at it, you see this really nice, rich, dark, chocolatey brown color. The texture is um, nice and moist and crumbly. Uh, it's pretty homogenous, right, with, with that dark brown color. It smells kind of sweet. It smells very earthy, right? It doesn't smell like fermenting. It doesn't smell weird. Um, yeah, it's a very rich, earthy soil. And then you want to sift uh, the compost to separate those larger materials that haven't been broken down. Um, and then you want to let it kind of, once you've sifted that material, you want to kind of put it in an area that's nice and enclosed for about a week or so to let it kind of curate um, and kind of let it, like, let it fully cool down so that you can integrate it into your garden. And that's pretty much the whole method. Um, next slide is just questions again. Great. We've had quite a few quotes come through, so I'll work through them. Um, I'll, I'll finish up with a couple of questions about what can and can't go in there and move more into process. So a question from Karen is, can I add twigs and branches? And I think Sort of that might be like what size of twigs should you stop at in terms of adding? Absolutely. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I had to learn this the hard way. I started putting like thicker twigs and branches in there and they would just never decompose. And then it was really hard to manage the pile that way. So I would like to like look at my pinky and say if it's smaller than the width of my pinky, then it's okay. Um, and again, breaking it down as small as possible, maybe using some pruners or something to kind of mince it up a little bit, and it kind of acts as like wood chips in a way. Um, if you have a wood chipper, even better. Uh, it might work for you to break down those materials faster. Um, but anything like wider than a pinky, hopefully a pinky is like pretty small. Um, yeah, anything wider than that is going to be hard to break down faster. Great. And then are dried pine needles considered a brown? Dried pine needles. Yeah, I would consider it a brown. Um, the only thing about pine is that it is very acidic. So it will, if you put a lot of it, it might change the pH of the soil. So keep that in mind. And the pH is really just whether or not it's alkaline or acidic. You want a pH somewhere in the middle. You want it kind of neutral. And that would kind of make it slightly acidic. So that stuff is great for berries. If you wanna, if you have a berry garden or you want compost specifically for like strawberries or blackberries or blueberries, that's a great additive for that. You could also put um, pine needles just like as as like a like like mulch onto your berries as well. So there's just different ways you could do that. 
And then um, talking about potential disease, Robin says, I sometimes see mold or mildew on the dried oak leaves in my garden. Are those considered diseased? Um, I wouldn't say disease. I think it's just the leaves decomposing. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell <laughs> whether or not it's it's like an actual disease or not. But if you see like leaves breaking down in your garden, that's a very organic thing of it to do. And mold is just one of those signs. So I would say it's fine. Unless you know for sure that that tree has had some sort of disease, then I would be cautious. Okay. And then I think this is the last question about what can and can't go in there. Are paper towels or paper towels and paper napkins okay? Yes, as long as they're not the bleached type. I don't like to add bleached paper towels or napkins. If it's like a you know carbon or cardboard colored one, just like the natural brown, then yeah, absolutely. And I encourage you to buy um, you know disposable um, products as you know as um, untinted as possible or un, you know unbleached, right? You don't want to add bleach to your to your soil. <laughs> Okay, sorry, last question about what can go in. Pat asks, is it okay to put sourdough starter discards in the compost pile? I'd heard that it, sound, that it was okay, but sounds like it might not be a good idea. Sourdough starter. Um, I would imagine you would want to use that sourdough starter to make more sourdough. <laughs> um, and then, I, yeah, I don't actually know if that would be, I don't think that would cause you know raccoons and rats to come i would say i would say it's okay um that's that's a good that's a good question i'm not 100 percent sure but um i would imagine it would be okay okay um this is a good one just to touch on for general purposes uh in terms of compost style what is the difference between hot pile and worm compost at sort of a high level mm. Right, right. So essentially, hot, hot pile composting is using all of the different critters, the FBI, to create this compost. What's nice is that it, it processes a lot faster and you can make larger quantities with it. And that's why I like it. Worm bins, you get higher quality because you're using these specific type of worms. They're not earthworms, they're red wrigglers. And they create this amazing compost that we call worm castings. Um, and this stuff is super great, super amazing, super rich stuff, but it takes a while for them to, to do it. And you don't get as much bang for your buck, but it's sort of this total call. You get, you get more quality, more condensed, but you get less. And then with a larger system, like a hot pile, you get more quantity, still amazing nutrients and structure for your pile, but not as, as condensed in nutrients. So it's kind of a, yeah, a, a balance between the two. I, 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 we have both here. And, I, you know, when we go out right now, I could probably show you what that looks like. Um, and you can see the difference in even the, just the size of the quantity that you would get. Great. Um, then George Ann asked, how do you recommend managing daily kitchen waste and weekly garden waste if you can't keep adding it to a pile? Mm, yeah, generally I, yeah, create another pile <laughs> um, if I have the space for it. And if not, then I recommend joining the compost hub because we can take those scraps in. Or if you can find a local composting site to donate your scraps to, that's another option. Um, encouraging your neighbors to start their own piles too, um, sort of creating this ripple effect and then showing them how to create their pile with those scraps that you don't know what to do with might be a good strategy. Um, and then if last, if you really just don't know where to do with them, I would put them in the, the city compost. Um, thankfully we have a city compost, um, but yeah. I mean, there's different outlets to it, but, you know, if you can't really do it, you know, maybe your last resort is just the city. Mm -hmm. 
I've heard some people freezing some of their food scraps mm. until a point where they can put it into their bin. Do you recommend yeah. that? That's yeah, yeah, that's a great option. If you have space in your fridge <laughs> or your freezer, mm-hmm. I mean, for yeah. sure. And the same Not thing goes for like, yeah, yeah, I, I've noticed that because I'll, I'll tell folks to like, yeah, the same idea. If like you have too much, just put it in your freezer, but they're always like, oh, it's like there's no room in my freezer or like, you know, that's weird or something. But if you have like a nice closed container and you put it in your freezer, it should last for a while, especially during those really hot summer days where your um, food scraps would probably get a little stinky a little faster. That's a good point. Yeah, freezing them. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, Pat has a question about the screening apparatus. Do you have a recommendation for the size of the hole in that screener? The size of, size the, of the hole? hole? The size oh, of the, the whole hole. thing? Not the whole thing, oh, but like, oh, oh. like the grid. Yeah, how big the, the hole grid, is yeah. The, mm-hmm. I would say don't use chicken wire, it's too big. <laughs> That's what you're thinking. I would say hardware cloth and it's about half inch, half inch squares. Yeah, Great. yeah. anything bigger than that, you know, you're gonna get a lot of large stuff like trickling down and anything smaller will be hard to like capture, you know, a good portion. And when you're sifting, you will get large materials in that stuff, which is fine. Um, because those large materials, once you integrate it, I mean, not huge materials, I'm saying like little bits and you'll see little chunks of like mulch and stuff. Like, you know, if it's like half inch or quarter inch, that's totally fine. All that stuff is just going to be um, mulch on top of your, your planter bed. And mulch is amazing because it helps, you know, it's, it's already kind of decomposed and it helps um, keep your soil moist. It also helps with weeds and that sort of thing. And what's nice is that, you know, the, the smaller particles will just trickle down and then that those larger particles will just stay on top. So it, it's totally fine if you see those slightly larger materials in there. Great. Um, a couple of people have asked this. Araceli asked about the compost system being in the sun versus shade. You said the shade you is where you cite yours for a couple of reasons. Is it okay for it to be in the more direct sun or would you really recommend people putting it in a shaded space? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I recommend the shaded space because I would want to use my garden sunlight as much as possible. Um, and I said, like, basically, if you do put it in more direct sun, that just means you have to uh, add more water or or just moisture levels it needs to be um, regulated a bit more. The shade is nice because it just, you know, it doesn't evaporate as, as fast. And that's why. That's why. Um, benefits of putting in the sun, though, if you do keep those moisture levels, I, it, it, it keeps it hot, right? Because it's heat, it's energy. And so... Um, yeah, you get the benefits is that is that it will process a little bit faster. Okay. Um, so. I think there's a lot of questions here, but I think I'll just take a couple more and hopefully some of these will be addressed when you do the demo outside. Um, but Sean mentions that their compost system is going to be on a concrete pad. So would you mm-hmm. recommend in that system or in that situation that they use the tumbler because there isn't that soil contact? Or is there a way mm-hmm. to make the soil saver work on a concrete pad? Yeah, you could definitely use the soil saver on a concrete pad, but it's sort of the same idea with the tumbler. You will have to bring in live live critters in there to, to inoculate it and get that system going. So you can use either one. It's totally fine. It's just the same sort of like ideas, like where, where are the rolling polies going to come from? Where are the worms going to come from? They got to come from somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have a lot more questions, but I I think at least some portion of them will be answered when you do the demo, which I believe is our next. Yes. Our next moment is to go outside and do a demonstration. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'll kind of hold off on these questions in here until after that. Um, would you like to transition outside and I'll launch this poll in the meantime? Sounds good. Okay. 
So if you could just mute yourself and turn off your video as you're moving. And then I am going to launch this poll. Um, we, I'm just, well, it's a demographic survey essentially. I believe that I have a little slide about it. We use this information to understand um, who we're reaching with our workshops, who we're still missing, who we're potentially not creating relevant content for. So this is a totally anonymous um, survey. So your answers will not be linked to anything personal about you, because I know it is some personal questions, but the information is really, really helpful for us just in terms of our planning year to year um, to just understand who's coming to our classes and who we're missing. So if you are willing to participate in that, um, we'd be really thankful because that is invaluable information for us. Um, I'm just going to leave it up for a couple of minutes. Uh, while Najiha is transitioning outside. And yeah, the, the responses are all completely anonymous. And if you don't feel comfortable answering any question, you can always choose decline to answer. So thank you for participating in that. I'm just gonna leave it up for a couple moments. Right on. So we are outside on the side of the house where we put our compost system. Um, I just kind of wanted to show you the different systems that we have and what we're using, what we're not really using. Um, so over here, we have the system that was generously uh, given to us by the county and we built it with my team. It was a lot of fun. Um, they gave us a design and everything. So essentially, uh, we bought materials like redwood materials. You can see the hardwood cloth on this side. Um, we use nice um, vinyl uh, plastic on top, which kind of helps if there is a little bit of sun, it kind of creates that kind of greenhouse effect to like add more energy into here. But really, it's just a covering so that we don't invite those unwanted guests in here. Um, and then we put these pallets here to like contain the pile a bit. Um, and that way we're able to, to, yeah, contain and manage the piles a bit better. I will show you a different system over here. So this is the soil saver. This is one that um, you could also get if you have a limited space. Um, you open it, it's similar. Um, the person who's using this has a lot of green in there, but it's okay. It has also a lid and it has nice um, locking. Uh, you know, you can lock it, again, just to make sure no one's getting in there. It's the same idea, you just wanna aerate it. And then when it's ready, all the good stuff is really at the bottom. So that you can see this one's sort of just inoculated. It has a lot of new green material in it. This has a really cool chamber and you can grab that, that good stuff that you got going. There's also a bio stack. They don't make these anymore, but these this design was super cool back in the day because again, you have this lid and then you have these three layers that you could alternate. And then when you're moving your pile, you could grab one of those layers, put it at the bottom, and then move your material that way. And then put another stack, add the material, and then keep moving it until you get to the top. So that's one way to do it as well. Then we have this tumbler here. Sorry, the screens are on top of this. So this is the screen you can use. Again, we just kind of repurposed wood that we found. And then we just, you know, tethered it, you know, uh, uh, make it, you know, a nice flush um, square. I would say about two feet wide, just so that you have uh, maybe a little wider than two feet. So you can put this on top of a wheelbarrow and then you can manage uh, the sifting that way. If it's a little narrow, you could still use it, but it's kind of hard because you can't really use the wheelbarrow as like support to, to, to be able to do that. Again, hardware cloth, you could see the little, squares they're about I think they're half an inch or an inch wide again and then that small material can just trickle down um, and then all the larger pieces I usually say that they're just carbon material lots of the times when you're sifting and then I'll just recycle that and reuse it into my new pile once it's ready so that's one and this is just one made out of two by fours same idea you just create a square frame and then you 
uh, either staple gun or you can use finishing nails to attach the hardwood cloth to it. And then this is our tumbler. Um, I'm not really using it because I have so much with the three bin system, but essentially it's this chamber, you open it up, you add your greens and browns in there. And then again, you have to inoculate it with some sort of um, FBI in there to keep it going. And then, yeah, and then you could just, it's on an axis so you can roll it. So this is good for folks that really don't maybe have a bad back um, or you can't really, um, you know, use uh, like heavy uh, labor. Um, so this is a good alternative for someone that can't do that. And then last but not least, or actually we can talk about vermicomposting too, but we have this system. This was our first system. Um, as you can see, it's kind of more open. We added the lid later on. But we really started this way. We started with pallet boards. We really just use different hinges to tether them all together. Um, and it's super economic, super frugal. Um, and it's just another really thrifty way to create a system that way. And it works really well. As you can see, we've had this one for like, I want to say like five years now. <clears throat> and the only thing is that, yeah, because it's pallets, um, the wood is not as strong or you know thick, so it won't last as long. And then uh, to contain it better, we use, again, hardware cloth, or in this case, you can use chicken wire because, you know, it's sort of just containing the pile. Um, but, you know, any sort of material you have to sort of contain it. I think, you know, a, a, a pallet board or a uh, plywood would work well, too, just on the sides. But what's nice about hardware cloth is kind of it kind of helps it breathe, uh, let the pile breathe a little bit better, too. So that's just another way that you could, you know, build your system. And then we talked a little bit about vermicomposting. So I just wanted to show the worm bin that we got, again, donated by the county, which is super cool, super discounts. Um, and then you have this nice lid here. And then this is a nice blanket to keep it nice and tucked in and moist. And then someone here is just mitigating that. So another workshop on how to, how to do this, but really you're just adding your, your material in this way and then kind of moving and rotating the different eating that they're doing. But you can see all the worms doing the job, right? I don't know if you all can see that, but there's one there and then here, right? Again, you just want to keep the optimal environment for them to stay in there. Sometimes if it gets too hot or cold, they'll try to escape. So you just really want to make sure that you're, you're creating the optimal living conditions for them. What's cool is that this has like multiple layers and chambers um, as, it's, as, as it's being processed, it will trickle down and then you can kind of mitigate moisture levels. There's a spout on this side, if you want to get close to that. <clears throat> and then if there's excess moisture, I would collect this moisture, but I'll just show here if there's any moisture, it will trickle down out here and it's like a really nice compost tea. Um, and then we have another one of these to uh, switch out as it's being processed, but that's a whole other workshop um, for another day. <laughs> All right, let's go back to our main system that we're gonna create a pile with. Put this here so it doesn't smack me in the face. <laughs> Um, so here you can see we have a pile already going. Uh, all my carbon is on top, as you can see. I should probably be wearing gloves, but I really like to get down and dirty in here. Um, I just kind of wanted to, I don't know if we could do a close up of all the critters in there, all the different types of critters that are working in this ecosystem. I don't know if y'all can see that. You can see all the movement in there. Um, I see a bunch of, uh, I saw roly polies and just tiny little critters, just lots of different types of bugs in there. And it's like, it's, it's, it's nice and moist. I don't know if you could see that. Um, it's still processing though. This is a pretty new pile. So it's, but you can see it's doing its thing. I wanna see how hot it is. So let's get our thermometer. One of those probes, right? And you have a, a nice gauge here that tells you how hot it is. Um, even has like a nice green zone. And these are specifically made for compost because of the long probe and it can get right to the center of the pile. So I'm just gonna push it in. And then if we get even close, maybe we could see it, the gauge going up high. It's really exciting when that happens. And hopefully it's hot enough. I actually didn't check this before coming in today. So it's working. It looks like it's going up slowly and sometimes it'll just boop. But as you can see, getting hotter, 
it's not going as fast as I'd like, so um, maybe we can leave it for a minute or so and come back to it and see how hot it is in just a second. All right. So, so that, as you can see, it's in its sort of um, middle stage there. Here we started a, a few layers from uh, some food scrap donations. So I imagine that we could just add layers to this. So you can see there's carbon on top, and then there's probably a few layers of the, that green material at the bottom. So I'm just gonna take off <clears throat> my palette here, just so that I can access the pile. So as you can see, we can have multiple um, piles going all at once, but it's this nice, manageable three cubed system. And then these are the buckets that we give out uh, at the hub. So these are just donations that we got. So this is my green material. And then I have a lot of brown material over here. Um, this is just stuff that was just um, sifted out. I probably use this for the layering that we want to do today. But then you can see we've been collecting a lot of cardboard here. Um, just you know anything I have and you can see I don't have any tinted really cardboard as much as possible also I'm probably going to take the stickers and, and tape off of this if I'm going to use it what's nice is that you can get wood chips delivered to your house for free if you make friends with your tree pruning company you call them up and you tell them what you want to do whether it's like mulching your pathways or you know you tell them specifically I want to add this to my compost pile Usually they're super cool and really nice and they will just deliver the mulch to you. And, um, and they, they, they kind of know already as well what type of material you're looking for. Like a nice um, wood chip material or redwood is usually a good start. And you can ask them even like what they're bringing you. Um, yeah, so let's get started. I'm gonna be using that as my browns, this is my greens. So what I normally do, if it's a brand new pile, I'll like throw it in there and I'll just start chopping it up. So this is great. You can see it's just all these residual like lettuce and potato peels, all sorts of stuff. What's nice is that I think this person, you know, they chopped it up. I don't think I even have to mince that. It looks pretty small to me. But let's see, let's keep going here. We want three inches, right? So I think I have to add more material. Ooh, look at this one. This is gorgeous. And you see, we have a little bit of onion peels, which is totally fine. Um, we got some coffee grounds. We have those avocado um, peels. Take off the stickers. It's really hard. I think, like, folks just, you know, it's hard to take off the stickers. So we try to just take them off as much as possible um, before adding it to the pile. Sometimes I just let it go, and then we'll sift it out later on, which is totally fine. But you just don't want plastic in your pile in general so take those off if you can get your kids to do it too <laughs> um let's see onions there's a little bit of onion in here like these onion ends no this is the top like this like i was talking about before it has all the roots on it still i could put this into the garden and then i can create a new onion so i'm going to put this to the side <laughs> but as you can see for the most part it's just a lot of great new material <sighs> Some of it looks like it was still edible, but that's totally fine. It's already been in this, so I'm gonna just add it. And you can see there's a giant stalk of, of celery, so I'm gonna mince that up. Let's get one more bucket, maybe. <clears throat> yeah, this is a good one, too. Tea bags and the like. Ooh, so this one was sludgy. I don't generally like that. Uh, it's totally fine, you know, as the system like decomposes, it's fine, but we want to get it like the, the bucket from before, kind of nice and fresh stuff, not too sludgy because it'll get stinky. It's totally fine still. I'm still going to use it. I just, you know, for our like olfactory sake, you, <laughs> uh, you really want to get like really good stuff that's not too old so now that I have a pretty good what I imagine to be three inches I'm going to take my spade here and I'm kind of going to spread it out and again this is my my you know my sauce and my veggies for this compost lasagna so I'm just going to come in 
give it a quick mint. You see the eggshells in there and all sorts of things. Just making sure the celery is nice and minced. And when you see, like, I think this is just like plant debris. Totally fine. If you do some like trimmings with your rose bushes or whatever, totally fine. Oh, I see a full potato up in here. No, no. So these potatoes, like I would have eaten these. Oh no, the eyes in there. So maybe not. But if it's an organic potato, I might have regrown it in my garden. This is a perfectly edible potato. I'm obviously not going to eat it, but I would have if they had not thrown it in there. <laughs> but it's okay. It's not going to waste. And that's, that's what, what you want. Ooh, look at that. Look at that chayote. This is a, a yam or sweet potato. Same deal, idea. We also have a food waste reduction series. We're going to do a Spanish version um, on the 15th. So I can definitely send you a link for that. And it's because of this. It's because I, um, I would hope that folks are using and utilizing their, their produce before you throw the whole thing in here. Um, because, yeah, we just want to, you know, save money, save the planet. But, you know, it's already in there. So it's okay. I'll still use it. But yeah, it's good to know how to use these ingredients, you know, to the max, as max capacity before we just toss them into our compost. Yeah, so it's a nice mint there. Now I have like a nice, pretty much three inch layer up in there. I'm gonna grab my browns. Usually I have like a, a wheelbarrow of it, but it's pretty accessible. And I'm gonna do the same thing. This is my pasta. Put it right on top. And the browns are also sort of small. Right, I'm just using wood chips. And it's a good workout. You don't have to go to the gym after this. Uh, in terms of ergonomics, try not to twist your back as much as possible. So this motion is terrible for your spine. You wanna make sure you're just taking that extra step to um, you know, not twist your back and keep your back straight and your lower back straight, right? So I just wanna go in here, make sure my back is nice and low. And yeah, I'm taking that extra step to make sure I'm not twisting, right? Sometimes you'll have the material and you're just like, shh, shh, and like doing that motion, and that's just not, not great. So yeah, so work in this pile. Um, another cool thing is that you can also use straw uh, if you wait. So the last day of Halloween or the, uh, on Halloween or the first day of November, you go to these different um, pumpkin patches and they will give you straw bales for free. Usually they're like $20, $20 for a bale if you just get it like at a hardware store or whatever. But if you're kind of strategic and you're observant, you wait for Halloween, they have all these straw bales. They don't know what to do with them. You pick it up. Maybe you have a friend who has a pickup truck. You get as many as you can, and then you can distribute them. We got about 15 one year, and I think to manage these systems, we used about 10 of them throughout the whole year, and it worked. And it, they're so compact that they just last very long. They have different absorbency levels, so they kind of decompose a little bit faster than a wood chip. So that's when I say you kind of have to play around with the recipe to see what works. Kind of like your different pastas, right? Angel hair pasta is going to cook a lot faster and be a lot thinner than your, you know, thick rigatoni or I don't know how to compare this, but or your thick lasagna sheets, right? It's a different consistency. And so it's like different cooking, cooking levels too. I hope that analogy makes sense. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and if I want to do cardboard, it's the same idea, right? I just rip it up into kind of like a you know, like a two-inch square piece. You know, you don't spend all day just ripping up cardboard, but nice, nice broken up material. Yeah. And then I'll do another layer. So this was three buckets worth. Let's do three more buckets. Why not? And then, yeah, so I'll just keep going. I'll keep going with these layers until I get to the very top. 
this was at the very brim and as it starts decomposing it will shrink it will shrink down because they're eating it right they're eating it they're living in it um, and it's processing it's turning into this rich stuff so if i go to the very bottom here maybe i can maybe i can use this i'm not very agile with the aerator and that's why i just so i can see now that the temperature's at 80 it seems like oops, like this is being really processed really well I just want to get this in here and just see if I can get to that really good stuff. So yeah, the aerator is <laughs> definitely for a person with two hands. <laughs> but you can see, I could do it with one. Just gotta get it in there. Oop, I saw a little centipede friend. It's done all the way here at the bottom. And then I'm just kind of wiggling it, getting it. Even just this motion here is really getting in there. And then usually you can get, I want to get it from the bottom as much as possible. It's really hard. Maybe I gotta go up a little bit. And then I'm gonna show you the compost fork method because I'm not very good with this one. Not too, right? You use your tools based on what your, your capacity is, right? There we go. And then you bring it up to the top and then see a little darker, a lot more bacteria working down at the bottom too. So that's good. And I can feel the heat. It's a lot hotter right here. I can literally feel the humidity coming out. So yeah, so that's how the, how the aerator works. And then the other method that I just made up, <laughs> this is just come in and wiggle it. This is the frugal method, I guess. And it's the same idea. I'm adding air pockets into the pile i'm just wiggling this yeah this is an arm workout <laughs> like i said it's pretty labor intensive that's why the uh the tumbler might be good for those that don't want to do too much labor but yeah same idea and i'm just coming in putting those pockets in all right let's do another layering Beautiful. Sludgy. It's okay. It'll work. Yeah, maybe you have something similar to this at your house. Uh, uh, in the beginning, there was a discount for one. You could be really thrifty. Sometimes you go to the dollar store and you get one of those $1 um, like garbage buckets, it's the same thing. It works, <laughs> right? These I think you can find at like a hardware store. These are three gallon buckets. Five gallons are pretty heavy. So we got three gallon buckets. That way it's not too big and bulky. And it's something you could probably put under your sink, right? But again, you can be really just you know, go on Craigslist or whatever. You'll find some really good finds on there usually. Oop, whole apples. So I will say this, I'm gonna be a, like if an apple starts to get to this point, yeah, maybe you wanna toss it in. But before that point, maybe it's just a bruise, like a minor bruise, just cut off that bruised part about an inch in, and then you can eat the rest of the apple. Obviously, if it doesn't taste good, you can toss it, but um, it kind of hurts. It breaks my heart a little bit when I see like a perfectly good apple and then you could have used part of it for like another recipe or something. Maybe cook it down, maybe not eat it raw, but you could use it for a different recipe. So I encourage you to take the food waste reduction class. All right, let's get our spade. And look, someone put pineapple up in here. I'm always, it's so interesting looking looking at what people eat at their houses. <laughs> you will like find like weird stuff from like foreign fruit sometimes. And you're like, whoa, I haven't seen this before. 
same idea. Mincing it up. And then that squash, remember the larger pieces, but squash is nice because it doesn't have a thick skin, so the critters can get in there pretty quickly. Same idea with the apples, but I kind of want to just start it off for them. Kind of like when you cut up your food for your baby, right? <laughs> just want to make it easier for them to eat. That's all we're doing. Cool. And look at this huge. Okay. Chop it up. See, I'm getting a workout. Who needs the gym? I got my garden. All right. Cool. That's my layer. Beautiful layer. Super colorful. All these buckets. And then again, just going to come in here with the browns. And I like to work my way from the back to the front just because it's like a nice, even layer. You can get very methodical with this. Hopefully, y'all feel like you're actually here in the garden. Sometimes I would have made some participants get down and dirty with me, help me out. <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes like the, for the first couple layers, maybe I'll get like a wheelbarrow of mulch and then I can just kind of dump it on until it's too high for it to to easily be dumped. Again, everything like anything, it's just practice. I'm already breathing kind of hard. All right. So it's an aerobic process for them, but an also an aerobic workout for you. It's a win, win, win. All right. So yeah, that's pretty much it, honestly. As you can see, you just have the right tools and materials. You start layering it up. And then if I had more grains, I would just keep going until I get to the very top. And then, yeah, mitigate it with the proper moisture levels, aeration, that sort of thing. Usually when I first add like new material, um, you know, it's pretty moist already, but then maybe like next week I'll add a little bit of water. Yeah. And then what's cool, in this frame, you can see the different layers and how they're decomposing. Like this stuff is a little bit more raw, right? And at the very bottom is where it's really doing a lot of the work here. Can't really see it that way, but it's kind of nice to have this sort of like side, <clears throat> this side view of, of what it's, what's happening. And let's see, I think that's pretty much it. And then, you know, as I go up the pile, I'm adding, these flats in, you know, as I go up, 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 up. Very nice. And then we built this in about three hours. Didn't take long. There was seven of us here building it, but with three people, you could probably build it out in a few hours, maybe a couple days. Um, actually, I think this was built in a, in a few hours and then the lid was like another project for another day. Um, you know, it just depends on your, your craftsmanship. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. It's really, I do feel like I'm in the garden, which is nice. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got, let's see, we've got about six minutes until noon. Um, and we've got quite a few questions, but I'm going to try to get to sort of the ones that are rising to the top and then maybe some of the others we can answer in writing after the workshop so we don't keep everyone for too long. So I want to make sure to address oh. most of what people have submitted. But just in terms of the um, things that are kind of coming up more frequently, there are a couple people who wanted to clarify. Um, so do you need to have all of the materials on hand to create this bin at one time? Or can you add it over the course of a few weeks, then stop adding and let it heat up? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you want to do. Like, I don't have any more green material. Maybe I can scavenge the garden for more of it. 
But if I don't have any, I'll just kind of let it do its thing and then come back next week and add more and add more until about, like I said, about three or four weeks in, then I want to stop and then let it do its thing for a few months and then it's ready by then. But if I add it like at this stage when it's just like already cooking and maybe even cooling down, um, yeah, I don't want to do that because you're kind of interrupting them. It's like adding new ingredients once the lasagna is like halfway cooked. You just don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, same idea. That is a very good analogy. <laughs> um, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of this specific three bin system that you have here, Georgianne asked if you could just briefly explain, is each bin a separate pile or are they somehow kind of interacting? Usually they are interacting. So usually this is like your first stage and then you'll move the pile as it's cooking. And this is the se second stage. So it's kind of like cooking, right? And then the third stage is usually when it's sort of ready or about to be ready. But since we have so much going on at the same time, we kind of just like, it, it works that way actually, because this is ready to go. And then as it's, as it's being ready to go, we kind of just go in, in, in each sequential order. Um, but yeah, basically they're just their own individual pile. Um, unless you're doing the, the, the system of moving and rotating it to each, each different spot. Um, but like I said, it really just depends on how, how fast it's being processed and like making room for that. So it's, it's a tricky balance between like letting it do its thing um, and letting it cook. Hopefully that, that process is pretty quick and then sifting it out um, and, you know, clearing that space for that new pile to begin. Okay. But you could do the same thing with a single pile. Yeah. Okay. Um, a few people have asked about the trench system and if there are any resources available about that. I don't think we have time to get into too much depth about that process today, but um, are there any resources that you have that we might be able to send as a follow-up to those folks? Um, not specifically about trenches, but essentially mm -hmm. a trench would just be a ditch in the ground. And it's the same concept. Instead of having these as your retaining walls, the actual ground is your retaining wall. That's the only difference. And then you're, you know, you're going right to the source, right? So all those critters in there that are sort of like in the parameters or like way in there, will just go straight to it and it'll be, it'll be great. great. It's sort of like, uh, yeah, I won't get into that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, just briefly, since the tumbler is a potential option for people at this workshop, um, could you briefly talk about like what you would recommend in terms of aerating that, if not just tumbling it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the tumbler itself, that mechanism on the axle, it, it's it's the aerating process. So when you're tumbling it, it's it's introducing the air into there, and you just need to rotate it once a week. Um, and then, like I said, you just want to make sure that the moisture levels are good and those critters in there are inoculating that, that, that tumbler. So uh, I would probably take, maybe I'll go in the center of this pile and scoop it out and then put it into the tumbler and then add my materials that way. As you can see, it's a smaller system too. You won't get as much stuff. Um, and then I feel like when you're using the tumbler, you're kind of disrupting um, the critters. <laughs> I mean, I kind of disrupted them right now by like wedging things in there. But when you're tumbling, it's like you're kind of taking their home and you're like flipping it upside down and they're flying everywhere, you know? So that's just my thing about tumblers. <laughs> I'm not, as you can see, I'm not the biggest fan of them, but they still work. It's not like they don't work. It's just, there's just a lot of, a lot of things to keep in mind with them. Um, let's see here. We have, we have quite a few more questions. We could, Let's see. We could do, a, maybe I could just get a sense of where people are in the meeting. <laughs> we could do a couple more minutes of questions if, if people are interested in hearing a couple more minutes of questions, or we could kind of cut things off here and um, answer those in writing at a later time. So if you could just give me a sense in the chat, if you'd like to wait a couple minutes, hear a couple more questions, or if you'd like us to sort of wrap things up. I haven't seen anything come in yet. 
Oh, it says more questions, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. Keep going, please. Okay. Time to wrap up. Questions okay. Yes, more questions. Ooh. I have to go. Let's stay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have to leave at noon because you send written questions to all. Yeah. Let's do a couple more questions. If you have to go, totally fine. Um, let's just do like five more minutes maybe, and then we'll wrap up, and we will send those answered questions out to the group. Um, okay. So let me just look here to see. Like okay, this is a, a one about or five more minutes of questions. You okay? Yeah. Okay. So this is about the tumbler or the soil saver on a concrete pad. Where do you kind of get the critters to inoculate those systems? You could come here <laughs> and pick up like a, a little bucket or a bag of it. Um, I don't know if you can look online for something like that. You could also just like go into your garden if you have a garden already and just kind of dig and find like a good amount of worms or whirly polies. If your garden soil is already pretty good, you could probably find some critters to, to add to it too. Another thing too is like, yeah, it's always good if you're just having your raw materials like the grains and the browns, you could always add like compost to, to it to inoculate it that way too. So adding that soil with those critters in it is always good, whether it's in this system or, or on a concrete slab or a tumbler. Yeah, it's just always good to like bring that life and that bacteria and all that, that e ecology into the system as soon as possible to get that process going. But yeah, so the concrete's like, there's a barrier there for those earthworms and all those critters to come in. So you kind of introduce, you have to manually introduce them to it. Yeah. Um, and then do you, is there, are there some books on composting you would recommend that we could send out to the group afterwards as like an additional yeah, resource? Yeah, I have, there's one manual that I just found online that's super good. There's mm -hmm. some videos that I can share out. Um, and yeah, yeah, there's, there's quite a few, not specific like book books, but I have a lot of resources that would help. Great. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's anything that has really, I think for the most part, the rest of these questions we could kind of answer one off or in writing after the workshop. So I think it might be time to wrap up. Ivana had one more slide that she wanted to share. And also for anyone left, we wanted to do a poll just to get your satisfaction of how the workshop was for you. So Ivana, if you want to share your screen. Honestly, I can turn off this. We can go back inside. Um, I'm as Ivana is potentially sharing her screen. I am going to actually. I'll just share my screen and. I will also launch this poll um, to just get an idea of how this workshop worked for you all. So if you wouldn't mind giving us feedback about if it met your expectations, if it didn't really, there unfortunately isn't a place within this poll to um, give written feedback. But if you do feel comfortable, if, if we somehow missed the mark and you want to give your feedback in the chat, that would be um, that would be great if, if there is something more nuanced that you wish we had covered or you wish we had done differently. Um, we're always trying to improve how we offer this and make sure that it's relevant for people. So I'm just going to leave this up for a bit to make sure that everyone who wants to participate and um, vote can do that. And thank you all for spending your Saturday morning with us. It's really nice to have this larger group interested in composting.
Ivana, is there anything you'd like to say about the, this contact info? Sure. The Facebook group. Um, I'm not sure if everybody can hear me since I'm in the Spanish translation channel. Actually, here I'll Yeah, see. we can hear you. There we go. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you everybody for sticking around for a few extra minutes. And um, I just wanted to close uh, with a reminder to uh, visit our website at smcsustainability.org. Email our uh, sort of uh, office-wide email or email me. I'll drop my uh, email in the chat here. Call our hotline. Or if you have a few of you have already joined our Facebook group um, during the workshop, so please do that. And if you continue to have questions, want to pose uh, issues to the community there, there are a lot of master composters there that can help you out. Uh, and lastly, follow us on Instagram or Twitter at SustainSMC. And a big thank you to Jesus and Michiko. You did a great job. And shout out to Jess. We had a really a large amount of questions today um, and Jess did a great job managing all of those. So thank you all for your uh, questions and your attention. And uh, we really appreciate you being here. So please go home and start composting. Yeah. <laughs> so you jump in there and <laughs> as a group, you know, get that shot. Yeah. yeah. One other note I'll say, I know a couple people are asking about that, um, how to redeem this bin offer if you do live in the county, and we'll be sending out a message about that um, next week. So if you attended this workshop, you will for sure get a message with all of the details about how to redeem that offer. So don't worry, we're not rescinding that. You know, it's just still to come information. Thank you very much for coming. Jess, I don't know if you mentioned yeah. this um, earlier and I couldn't hear you, but um, just to let folks know, I've noticed a number of questions about how do I know how to get the bin. All of those details will be sent out to you in the follow-up email. So um, mm -hmm. if that for some reason is unclear, you can just respond to the person that sends that. It's It'll be clear once you get that email. 